to the 305th episode of the Jamie Delaney Plant-Based Wellness Podcast. My name is Jamie Delaney, and I'm your host. I'm a plant-based cardiologist and endurance athlete living in Southwest Florida. Welcome, and thank you for listening. May is a birthday month. First, my mother, the diva, then the dietitian Addie, and now this weekend will be Caleb James will be one year old. So happy birthday to my favorite and only grandson, Caleb James. Well, great week for the plant-based striders. We were at a local 5K last Saturday. The Girls on the Run, which is a great program. Uh, kudos to um, the, the administrators for that run, Mrs. Amontry. Um, they did an excellent job. There were over 400 runners at our local Port Charlotte, Punta Gorda Girls on the Run event. There were little girls clubs uh, represented from the grade schools of uh, all around the area. And then there were a lot of runners from the community that ran. Um, it was so nice to see parents and children running and signs encouraging kids to run. There was a local cross-country boys team that actually participated. So it was a great day. No masks. There was hugging. There was high-fiving. People were standing around smiling ear to ear to be out in the beautiful Florida sunshine. And we had a great plant-strong, plant-based runner showing. We had um, everybody. Everybody got to the podium from our group. That that's pretty cool. We started with a seventy-year-old. They got a third-place finish. We had two people, both a man and woman, in the sixty to sixty-four-year-old age group that finished third. Um, we had uh, Michael finished uh, third in his age group, um, mainly because he paced me, and I actually won the Grand Masters in the fifty-five to fifty-nine age group. So. Yep, local event. We had a great time and a great showing. I was very impressed. The watermelon queen and her court were there, and they handed out watermelon, so that was pretty exciting. It is Florida watermelon time, and if you haven't got your Florida watermelon yet, go get one because they're really good this year. And I'm sure they're in all the local grocery stores being shipped all over um, to where you live now. They also had a little swag bag, a T-shirt as well. Actually, they had a girl's tank running top, which I thought was very cool and different. Uh, usually, girls are left with, you know, short sleeve boy-like uh, T-shirts, but this was a tank this year, so I, I really appreciated that. There was an apple and a granola bar and um, a water as well as a little metal in the, in the swag bag. So very nice, uh, nice event. Uh, again, you know, uh, it was nice to see people, you know, I think that's such a good event to train kids to run a 5K. A lot of people out encouraging them along the way. The route was along the water here in Punta Gorda. And uh, so it was just a just a beautiful, beautiful day. Actually, I believe our Hutch, uh, you know, our endurance athlete in training, set a PR for his 5K. So he's just tearing it up any place he goes. Um, I usually do, you know, my run-walk method, but for a 5K, I, I ran the whole way, and um, I wanted to see how I could do, and I hadn't been running the whole way, and so, a couple, I, you know, I will say I trained up a little bit for the 5K. I was doing some intervals, and then I was doing some longer efforts uh, without stopping, and, it, you know, after getting that used to um, – walk run method you know you kind of you kind of start liking that walk method so I had to you know get used to breathing hard for a prolonged period of time so uh, it was it was nice to see that uh, I could I could still push it a little bit and because of that I'm you know gonna uh, keep that training going uh, I think we just signed up for an ultra in San Antonio in September it's actually September 11th so if anybody wants to do an ultra they have all kinds of different events there that weekend, but uh, we'll be there for that. But I, uh, I thought, well, you know, this is a pretty good time in this um, before build up for another ultra to try to increase the speed and, uh, a little bit because we do have our marathon Boston qualifier coming up in December. So I thought, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to keep uh, adding that little uh, type of training into my uh, my regimen. So uh, one day a week, I think I'm going to try to do a little speed work now that, uh, you know, I'm starting to get a little cocky now that I haven't had an injury for a while, but i um, going to give that a shot. I also did a, um, a uh, stretch class this week uh, with a local friend. If you live in the Venice area, um, shout out to Chris Riccia, and he has a vegan restaurant that's wonderful, um, Seed to Table. He and his wife, Kim, own, 
And if, if you're in the area, stop by and, and get some food there. But um, Chris is a, I guess, semi-retired ballerina or maybe is retired. He teaches some classes now, so I don't know if you can call anybody retired or not. But he taught a, he teaches a stretch class as well as an adult ballet class. And so I, I went and took his uh, stretch class, which he incorporated a, um, a good bit of, I guess, warm-up for ballet stretches in his program. And uh, it was really good because, you know, if you run all the time, it's amazing how stiff your feet get, how stiff your ankles get, lack of uh, uh, mobility. And of course, I'm always preaching to everybody, you know, hip mobility, hip mobility, hip mobility is the key to saving your back. So he did a really good exercise. I mean, he, he took my hamstrings to and my hips to some new levels and my feet to some new levels, so that was really good. Uh, the other thing that I've incorporated in um, uh, is uh, a little jump roping every day. So I, I'm doing a little jump roping, um, um, just gradually increasing that rep. Not a whole lot, but it, it um, I believe that's going to be helpful as far as foot landing, uh, uh, um, running cadence, and just uh, maintaining little tendons in your feet and ankles uh, for both a little bit faster running and uh, the trail running. So that kind of leads me into why people don't run or say they can't run. And most of the time that's uh, because people say, well, their knees hurt or they have a hamstring injury or they have pain in their hamstrings. They have pain in their Achilles, uh, plantar fasciitis puts people to the couch for years on end, and of course the um, recurring back injuries that some of us get uh, that can sideline us. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of those because, again, we are developing a lot of people over in the plant-based striders uh, that are following that page. If you haven't joined that Facebook page, go on over to plant-based striders. Um, you can follow with us and see where people post. We're not as active as we could be, but, you know, working on it. But um, we're going to try to post local races. And if you're a plant-based strider, I'll encourage you to post your local race or what's coming up. So if people want to travel to your area and visit you and run with you, that's a great idea as well. But anyway, looking at why some of these injuries occur... Um, you know, I, I've noticed, uh, when I watch our group run and when I, you know, was at the 5k watching, watching people run, you can see why a lot of people get into trouble, especially with their knees. A lot of times we try to, um, we think running is a, um, just a fast way of walking. So we tend to hit the same way. And a lot of people, you know, extend their leg and hit with their heel and actually just bound into their heel that's out in front of them and with a, with a straight leg and you just ram your um, lower leg up into your, you know, your upper leg and basically cause knee pain, right? Because you're, you're, you're breaking every time you hit, hitting on your knee and then you have to have your, the, your whole body weight come over that before you can lift off and go again. So running form is a huge reason why people have knee injuries, not running in general. And it's hard to break it to some people that, you know, they don't run like a Kenyan. And, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people, too. I'm always trying to work on my form. But that's, that's really a big reason why people's knees start to hurt. Um, and the other thing that I've noticed is people buckle when they hit. And again, that, co that comes from the, all the sitting we do all day long and our glutes not activating. And so when we hit, we just kind of almost collapse into our knee and our, and our lower leg. And you see this big collapse. And if you think about running and um, how you would move faster through time, it's, it's more like a pogo stick or a spring than it is, you know, this big um, soft, you know, landing and bounding up and down. So the, the, the weaker the spring is, the more that it collapses and expands, the more energy that's leaked and the more chance that you have for the joints to get injured because they're kind of hitting and rolling around or needling around before they come up. So if you hit with a very stiff spring, so, you know, um, you know bounce from your ankles, bounce from your knees and engaged glutes and hips, you have a lot less collapse, a lot less energy leak and a lot less chance of injuring your ankle and your knee. So that's one reason why I started jumping rope because 
Um, if you jump rope with your toes together, you basically simulate how you should actually land when you're running. So you're, you kind of land at a midfoot and you're, when, you're, when you're jumping rope, and there's not a lot of leak because you have to get ready to jump over the rope when it comes again. So if you collapse a lot, you'll never get up to jump around the rope again. So that springiness is um, improved by jumping rope. So you might want to try that or just jumping in place. Um, is a is a way to simulate how you would you, you should land when you're running. The other thing that I noticed, um, I usually run in ultra shoes that are flat, uh, meaning that the heel is no higher than the toe. Um, but for this race, I actually ran in a pair of Hoka's that had the heel a little bit more elevated, and it has they're kind of designed for to be more of a racing shoe, and it, it they have the place where you should hit right in the midfoot. So it was a little bit of a training tool for me to run in these shoes that if I get too much forward, I would lose the effect of the shoe. Obviously, if you got too much backward, you lose the effect of the shoe. So there's a sweet spot that you can actually feel that's right in the midfoot. And it was it was kind of interesting to, you know, kind of concentrate that on that, especially when I was getting tired to make sure I was hitting in the sweet spot, not unlike a golf club that if you hit the, you know, if you hit a golf ball in the sweet spot, of the club, it's going to go a lot further than if you hit it on the toe or uh, or the heel, and, and basically that's because of energy leak. So that that pretty much fixes your knees, um, so you don't have to worry about knee pain. Um, there's lot, been a lot of doctors over the year, and the doctors round, lounge will say, "You still running? You still running? You still running? Oh, my knees hurt! Oh, you're going to hurt your knees!" And you know, I got to tell you, that my knees uh, feel fine. The only time my knees will start to bother me a little bit is if I haven't done good stretching of my upper leg muscles, my quadriceps, or my shoes are starting to wear out. So sometimes I try to push my shoes a little longer than, um, you know, the uppers look pretty good. The bottom is what's starting to wear a little funny um, because of that my, you know, the way I hit uh, my incorrect uh, striking motions. So if the shoes get a little bit more worn, it can cause me to hit a little bit uh, off more and and lead to a little bit of um, discomfort and I know you know if I start to get any of that it's okay what are you doing uh, you need to work on your quadriceps stretch and look at the bottom of your shoes you need to change your shoes out most people can get about um, you know three months um, out of a pair of shoes 100 miles out of a pair of shoes uh, some people can push it more, you know, some people can have to push it, you know, can't, can't take it as far. Um, like I said, I, I'm hard on the way I hit, um, got a lot of, got a lot of, uh, imbalances in, in the way I hit. So I, I tend to wear shoes out a little bit faster and have to be careful. Plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendon issues are basically um, all connected. It's it's calf tightness. People don't realize how tight their calves are, um, and they try to stretch their Achilles tendon, but that's where you connect to the bottom of your foot. So if you try to pull on that, it's like trying to pull on the metal part that connects a spring to, you know, if, if anybody's had a trampoline, there's a metal connection to the frame, and then you have the part that bends in the middle. Well, if you're trying to stretch the, the you know, the metal clamp, it's not going to go anywhere. What you want to stretch is the muscle or the or the part that you would jump on, so it would translate to your upper calf muscle. And there's several muscles that go down and meet, um, you know, some three large ones and and several small ones that go down and connect and into your Achilles and into the plantar fascia at the bottom of your feet and actually go all the way down to your toes. So it's really important to do mobilization of your feet and of your calf, walking on a tennis ball, um, you know, doing some, uh, making sure that you have good toe mobility, even having your hands between your toes, doing a lot of toe stretches. Uh, you, um, Chris had us with our feet up the wall, so laying on your back with your butt against the wall and your legs up the wall and doing some uh, pointing your toes, bending your toes back to try to get that stretched. We, you know, we were on our toes, then we were, uh, you know, uh, different positions to try to stretch your toes out. If you can imagine how a, you know, a ballerina uses their toes and points their feet, so um, that was quite interesting. But um, 
you know, that's, that's a good way to work on your feet. And then your calf, um, Kelly Starrett, uh, I can put a link to him in, in the show notes. He's a great physio um, that talks about a um, salt tooth method where you take your, um, say you take your right tibia, your right foot you, on your knees and you come across your left calf uh, just using your, your shin bone basically to come across your and break up some of those tissues. You can roll on a ball. Uh, there's various things you can, you know, you can look up online. Uh, certainly we work with people in our practice to, to loosen up muscles and to get more mobility. That's, that's part about what our practice is about with people. Because I, I watch people come in every day, you know, and I, I look how they stand. Uh, I look how they walk. And you, you can tell a lot about how somebody feels by how they stand, how they walk, what their balance is. And that's a huge part to, to grow and old. Um, if you, you know, if you're standing on with, you know, um, unbalanced to start with, it doesn't take much to topple over and everybody worries about running out and getting a DEXA scan to see if they have osteoporosis, but they don't do anything about their balance. And consequently a DEXA scan doesn't do anything to predict who's going to break their hip or who's not going to break their hip. Uh, you can be made of, uh, you know, porcelain. If your balance is good, great. You're never going to break your hip because you don't fall down. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can have pretty strong bones, but if you're falling down all the time, there's a good chance you're going to twist something and, and fall over. So, um, um, you know, balance, is, balance and posture and gait and mobility are, are huge as far as um, not only running, but also walking and then not getting injured. And then the back, um, you know, what I have found uh, with my multiple back injuries is I try to do too much too quick. Um, I use my back instead of my glutes, uh, which consequently will, you know, lead to a back injury, um, and get out of balance with my muscles. So mobility, again, it comes back to hips and, um, glute strength and form, uh, to try to, uh, try to avoid that. And then just paying attention, you know, take the easy days when you need to take the easy days. I have to tell a funny story, um, about the, stretch class the other night so chris is a ballerino and at his uh, development in their fitness area um he rented space and it uh, the space is usually for an adult ballet class so when i came to his development i came to the the guard shack and you know i said i'm here for uh, chris's and i you know i was going to do a stretch class he said you mean the ballet class and it's like yeah And and the guy says you look like a ballerina which was hysterical if you if you know me because um, I grew up trying to avoid ballet like the plague. Um, I I did take tap lessons, um, and you know I'm thankful that my mother made me do that because um, it it really gave me um, great confidence to go out and in public speaking and to, and to be on stage and and things of of that nature and, and gave me some coordination. And she, you know, and she, and, and she, um, I, I took a modern dance class again against my will for the most part, but, you know, obviously it helped with grace and poise and some of those things have stuck with me over the years. And, uh, you know, shout out to my dancing teacher, Debbie Libator. If you've listened to this podcast many years, well, when Eddie got married, we actually got together with the dance, the tap dancing teacher, and she helped us do a flash mob dance for the wedding. So, you know, that's my, my dancing ability for the most part. So ballet was never, never a part of it. But the, the funny issue is because of COVID and uh, just as time goes, I've let my hair grow and it is now white. And so I keep it pulled back into a bun like, you know, you might see a ballerina wear. So after all these years, I've finally become a uh, ballerino ballerina lookalike so to speak uh maybe but probably not quite but anyway so I was, anybody that knows me would get a chuckle out of that because probably that'd be the last thing that anybody that knew me would associate me with but i do very much admire chris i, I gotta say uh watching chris and his wife move in that class uh was very just even in a stretch class was ger- very art um uh, inspiring and you know their grace when they move it is it really is something to be admired so it took me you know 58 years to appreciate that but I no, I, I can't say it took me 58 years I, I have appreciated ballet for a lot longer but 
as gr- growing up, I just couldn't see myself uh, participating in that. Anyway. The other thing that he had in that class was looking at, uh, you know, adductors, which are the upper leg muscles, the muscles in your legs that pull your legs together. Uh, and we did a lot of that stretching. And you can do um, stretching and release with a ball. Uh, that Using a, a ball about the size of a tennis ball or a hard ball like a lacrosse ball is really good on the muscles to go perpendicular to the way the muscle goes as opposed to parallel. can really loosen some up some of the knots as well as stretching. Again, it gives you much more mobility in your hips. Um, and then if you know if your hips are moving right, your knees are moving right, your ankles are moving right, and it makes things very good. The other muscle that gets um, people, if you look at people at a finish line, you see them lean into the left or lean into the right. And that is largely because they start to collapse with the, the um, quadratus laborum muscle. And those are the, the big muscles that attach your rib to your pelvis. And so when one is as weaker than the other or you start to get fatigued and you start to lean one way or another and you have that collapse mainly because of weakness there and weakness in your glutes, um, you can really wrench your back. So, you know, we did a lot of stretching there uh, in Chris's class, but I also like to take a ball and roll again from my spine uh, out to my ribs uh, and use that as a release and it really helps a lot. So that's, uh, you know, that's my, my uh, stretch story, in a, <laughs> my, baller, my ballerina stretch story in a, in a nutshell. The other thing that happened to me this week uh, that was irritating um, and sad was that one of my 90-year-old plus patients fell and broke his hip. And I, I really am going to blame it on COVID. Um, he was, uh, he actually did dance a lot and went to a local um, community center to, to do ballroom dancing. He played tennis with COVID. Obviously, that was all shut down. Um, he was afraid and his family was afraid for him to go out given his age. So he didn't do much but kind of puttered around the house. His balance became worse. Um, he finally uh, decided to go visit his sister. He actually got the vaccine um, and, you know, was afraid, uh, not afraid then to go, to go visit his sister, and he subsequently tripped and broke his hip. So the nurse practitioner wrote a note and uh, shared it with me, um, during which time she noted that he was a vegetarian, which he actually is a whole food, plant-based vegan at this point. But she said, since you're a vegetarian, you're probably not getting adequate amounts of calcium, therefore you fell and broke your hip. And so she noted in her note that she counseled him on getting enough calcium and vitamin D, and she would contact his primary physician, who was me, to let me know that uh, I should follow up and do a DEXA scan and make sure he's getting adequate calcium and protein. So you can imagine how happy I was to see that note. Um, I didn't contact her back yet. Uh, there's no reason to get into a contest. Um, his daughter actually did a very fine job at insisting that he have plant-based food. His sister brought him whole food, plant-based food while he was in the hospital because the meals were awful. He actually devised a way to get more attention and more physical therapy because he didn't think he was getting enough physical therapy after he had his hip fixed. So he would say he had to go to the bathroom, and then um, he would ring the bell because he needed assistance, and they would take him, and then he'd wait a little bit, then he'd go back, and he went back and forth so that he could actually get extra walking in by going to the bathroom and back. So that is how you survive, my friends, being 94 years old and whole food plant-based and and looking out for yourself. So just to go over things, uh, he gets plenty of protein. He is a very well-developed, muscular 94-year-old gentleman who, again, played tennis and dance prior to COVID. He gets his calcium from oats and greens and beans that he eats um, uh, adequate amount. He actually makes his homemade own homemade bread. Um, he, he makes all of his food as well uh, and takes care of himself and sautés vegetables and freezes vegetables. They have a garden. So he's getting plenty of calcium and he gets outside. He's tan. We've checked his vitamin D levels. They are good. 
he fell because he didn't get the exercise and training that he was used to getting because he was locked in because of COVID. So instead of looking to things that they could change or improve on, you know, they basically just wanted to throw a calcium pill and a vitamin D pill at him, get a DEXA scan, radiate him a little bit, and send him on his merry way. I saw a similar post today by a registered dietitian that worried about women getting enough protein, and that was the reason why they were falling and getting osteoporosis. And it was suggested that people eat things like peanut butter and faux meat, you know, um, processed vegan foods and um, other sources of nuts. And obviously, we don't have to worry about getting enough protein if we get enough calories to maintain our lean body weight. So if your lean body weight is 150 pounds then you need at least 1,500 calories to maintain that weight if you sit in a chair. You need extra calories for your movement. So let's say people walk five miles or up and about all day. They easily burn at 150 pounds, 2,000, maybe even 2,500 calories a day, depending on their activity level, how much they run, walk, swim, whatever they do. So if you get in 2,000 calories, let's say, and 10% come from protein, that's 200 calories. There are four calories per gram of protein. So if you divide that 200 by four, that's 50 grams of protein. Plenty for a woman that's doing those activity. If you increase your activity, you increase your protein intake when you increase your calorie take. You don't have to eat high fat sources. Nuts are 85, 75 to 85% fat. So yes, there's protein, but it comes at a price with fat. And in a lot of people, that plant fat is turned into cholesterol. In diabetics, that plant fat contributes to poor diabetes control. And when people say, you know, snacking on nuts, it usually leads to excessive amounts of nuts. When people start cooking with nuts and making a bunch of sauces and desserts, it turns out to be an excessive amount. When people start using nuts as flowers, like almond flour, then those are more omega-6s and omega-3s, so you, you're shifting toward a more inflammatory state. So more inflammation, higher cholesterol, more fat, more calories. You're better off getting your protein from beans and grains and, and, and just eating a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. When I hear oil-free, but then the next line, they talk about the nuts um, and seeds that are used to substitute as oil. It does the same thing in the body. So whether you chew the nut and it breaks down into fat or you take the fat in, most of the time in people that are predisposed or already have high cholesterol or diabetes, that contributes to making things worse, not better. So if a bread is made with tons of nuts and seeds, as well as a lot of flaxseed and then added oils, it's going to be hard on people. Mary's crackers is another one, you know, nuts and seeds. It doesn't say anything about oil, but if you give that to a diabetic, their sugars go way up because you're blocking the uptake of glucose by fat. So you have to be, really be careful how, how people word and, you know, go around things. Um, you know, uh, same same discussion along uh, the same lines is, you know, uh, some of the meat uh, substitute hamburgers beyond, you know, somebody told me this week, well, they don't eat McDonald's anymore, but they go to Burger King and get it beyond, beyond meat or whatever the kind of meat uh, meatless burger that they get a Whopper. Well, it's substituting one thing. There's no cholesterol in the meatless variety, but that's the only thing different. There's still salt and a tremendous amount of fat, and they're not doing themselves any favors by doing that. It's just fooling yourself or sticking your head in the sands, thinking you're doing something better than you did. And yes, it is a little better than you did, but not adequate enough to turn the ship around if you already have high cholesterol or you're overweight or you have diabetes and you're actually trying to clean out your metabolic uh, excess in your cells. But at the same time, you can enjoy yourself and have wonderful plant-based meals and wonderful summer barbecues and picnics. And Addie and I will be hosting another Zoom webinar June 16th 
from 5.30 to 8. And we will go over six recipes that are great for summertime barbecues and picnics that are transportable, that you can take and enjoy and not feel like you're the odd guy out and not getting to enjoy yourself. I get sick and tired of hearing people saying, oh, I can only have a salad. Oh, I can only have a salad. Well, you can have only a lettuce salad or you can really ramp it up and have a salad with all kinds of different seasonings and dressings and different kinds of vegetables or beans or grains or potatoes. And you can, you can really make the salad good. We can do cowboy caviar. There's all kinds of different things that you can do. There's a million different burgers that you can do. Are they like a regular hamburger that made you sick before? No, but are they tasty? Yes. So I'd love to have you join us on our Zoom nutrition webinar, June 16th, where we'll show you how you can have fun during the summer and have good meals and have some desserts, but not shoot your cholesterol and your glucose and your weight um, up out of the roof when you're trying to get things under control. So that's, that's what we have in mind for that. You can go over to drdelaney.com, D-O-C-T-O-R-D-U-L-A-N-E-Y.com to get your tickets for that event. We love to share our um, family fun recipes with you. We'll also be taking questions during that, having a Q&A, and that'll be available for people to watch a week later, uh, as well as send us questions for the whole week. Um, and and it's uh, free to our members uh, of the practice. I love medicine because it's like being a detective. People come to me with something that is wrong or not right, or they want to get better from where they are. Um, they may have an ache or pain, or they may have something else is wrong. And I get to take time and talk to them about what their symptoms are and devise a way to help them get better. The way my practice is now, most of the time the people have to do the work because most of it involves nutrition and different exercises. But I do love to, again, work with people on their mobility, uh, work with people on their fitness, work with people that have pain, work with people that have lifestyle problems so that we can make them better. And, you know, that also counts for the immune system. If we make people's immune system better, we don't have to be so worried about trying to kill every bug and virus that we come in contact with. There's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because with COVID, um, we focused on virus, you know, this, this terrible virus for wherever it came from, and we have to eliminate it or eradicate it. And there's a war on this virus, and the frontline people are taking care of people with this virus. It's a virus, just like a bacteria just like a fungus, just like we, there are all kinds of, we named this virus. But the fact that we're trying to wage war on things that are always going to be around us in some form or another is really not the way to go about it. And before COVID became a household word, the microbiome was a household word. And we were learning about that, you know, stamping out bacteria and disinfecting everything to the point of, you know, selecting for superbugs was probably not the way to go. You know, back in the 40s and when Listerine came out, we thought we would kill every bacteria known to man. But we, you know, over time have learned that the ecosystem in our environment, whether it's in our gardens or in our guts or on our skin, has to be maintained in harmony and going about it as we're going to kill everything in our way does not work. So the idea with COVID, virus, bacteria, any of this is learning to have a good ecosystem that we live in, that live on us, that live within us, so that we can live in harmony with these things. So it doesn't have to be war on viruses or war on people who don't get vaccines or war on people that don't think like you. It's how do we live more in harmony with people, with viruses, with bacteria. And it really starts at home and getting out and, you know, getting your hands dirty and getting into the environment. We know that, you know, part of being around other people like at that 5K is that we share microbes. We share microbes in small dosages 
that allow our immune systems to exercise just like our bodies exercise and we become more strong. You know, I think that's a much better way than trying to take the elephant gun approach and have our bodies produce all this excess of firepower against a potential threat when we can just be in good shape and be able to live in harmony with, with our environment. So, you know, there, there may be things that are uh, more weapons against us that we don't know. And if that's the case and that's out there, then, you know, somebody set me straight. But if we're dealing with, uh, you know, viruses and bacteria that are in nature, then we ought to be able to live in harmony with them if we keep our own bodies, health, our own bodies healthy. I've been doing this podcast for, well, it's 305 episodes and about one a week for some time. And I had the pleasure of um, getting some help from Ashlyn Dave. From it's His podcast is Running in the Center of the Universe. And that is the center of the universe is, uh, according to Dave, Ashlyn, Virginia. And I still listen to Ashlyn Dave's podcast. And he is a runner, and he calls himself an everyday middle-of-the-pack runner, and he has everyday middle-of-the-pack friends that run with him and acquaintances, just like I do. And we all struggle with health and aging. Um, You know, again, Dave's getting older, I'm getting older. But I've been hearing that he's had a lot of people on his podcast, or a lot of people that run with him, that have had heart attacks or bypasses, at a very young age, despite being runners. And I'm hearing more and more of that, and it's very disturbing to me, that more and more people are having episodes at a very young age, despite being runners. And so I'm going to have Dave on the podcast so that we can kind of pull our audiences to try to educate people a little bit better that, you know, it's not all about the running, it's about nutrition. Um, And you, you know, again, what you could survive on in your 20s is not what you can thrive on in your 50s. And one of the things that I heard one of his guests talk about was he had a bypass and coming back and running a half marathon after bypass, which is fabulous. But the question was, what did he change after that? And did a bypass cure him of his vascular disease? And of course, it didn't. A bypass bypasses just that, the main blockage. So if you do a heart cath on people and you find three blockages that are over 90% or seven, you try to bypass a vein across that blocked road, so to speak. So a bridge over a blocked road, an overpass, you're creating an overpass to supply blood downstream. It doesn't do anything to the process of forming blockages. It doesn't cure vascular disease. It takes care of the immediate danger or the immediate problem. Those veins, veins and arteries are used to do the bypass. Usually there's one vein or one artery used called the left internal mammary artery. And then there are veins used called the saphenous vein grafts that's taken from the legs. Sometimes there's arteries taken from the arms. And my, I'm going to talk more about it when Dave's on the podcast, but... The reality of it is to maintain those vessels, you have to take care of yourself just like you would have prevented heart disease in the first place. So nutrition is extremely important and you can't outrun. Once you have disease, you are no longer thriving. You are merely surviving. And so in order to begin thriving, we have to change the pathology that we've accumulated you know, metabolic waste in the blood vessels, metabolic waste in the cells uh, to the muscle. So that's what we're going to talk with him uh, in the next couple of of weeks. And and you're going to hear from him about some of his friends and, you know, how they go about it. But, you know, I, I love running and I want people to run and I want people to exercise, but I, but I, but we need this focus on nutrition to actually be able to turn the ship around and make people better and make them thrive instead of just survive. And it's not done with medicines. It's going to be done with nutrition. So go over and get your tickets, drdelaney.com, to find out how to make good, healthy food that you can take to a picnic and take to a 5K or a 10K or a marathon afterwards to eat so you can have a good time with your friends and then eat. Go out and exercise and enjoy yourself. And I'm going to go to Houston, and I'm going to have a great birthday party with my grandson, Caleb. And we're going to have wonderful plant-based food. And he's been a plant-based 
baby since hour one of his life. And uh, enjoy yourself, and I'll be speaking with you soon. Thanks for listening. Email me at jamie at drdelaney.com with any questions. I appreciate you listening. If you really like the podcast, go on over to iTunes and give me a five-star rating. That helps get the word, word out. We also love to have you in the practice, so feel free to give us a call at the office, and I'll talk to you about the practice on the phone at no charge. Have a great weekend. <laughs>